Hello everyone, welcome to the Linear Elasticity course. In today's video, we're going to discuss the constitutive equations, or in other words, you used to have the name for these equations as the stress-strain relation, or how the stress is related to the strain in addition to the related through the different material parameters. So these constitutive equations are very important and it is highly important in, in terms of continuum mechanics and linear elasticity to understand these relations and how we can represent them or drive them for different types of materials, especially going for linear elastic material. And this is going to be the focus of this, of this course. In the previous video, we already discussed the stress in relation to the surface tractions or the external forces. Also, we discussed the stress in relation to the body forces through the equations of motion. This is the, in this video, we already, we're going to discuss the stress in relation to the strain. So we're going to have all the, the, kinet, the kinetical parameters already relate, related to the kinematical parameters. The kinetics, which through the stresses, as we discussed the previous meeting, the stress it is conjugate to the force. And the, the strain, it is related, it, simply the strain is related to the displacement gradient or the deformation of the material that describe the kinematical deformation of the material itself. So you could say that this is the kinematical parameter and this is the kinetical parameter. So how they would be related together, this is what we are going to discuss through this video, through something very popular or commonly known as the constitutive equations or the constitutive relations. Make sense? In the mechanics of material class, as I mentioned, you used to have the name of, uh, or the instructor didn't mention to you the constitutive equation. He mentioned to you stress-strain relation. So this is stress-strain relation, like Hooke's law, for example, this is one of the most popular stress-strain relation. Is the, is, is, it is generally or commonly known as the constitutive equation. So the objective through this video is to show you how we can drive these constitutive equations, not driving them actually, but we're gonna start from the strain energy density function and I'm gonna show you how we can obtain these constitutive equations and then we're gonna discuss how we can represent them for different materials as I said. So, starting with this definition of the strain energy, strain energy, density function. that we're going to give it a name as W, uppercase W, this is, or some people would give it a name like U, uppercase U. Anyway, it is a strain energy density function. So what is a strain energy density function? So the stress, the strain energy density function, this is like you could consider, like assume that you do have a volume or a continuum body. And this continuum is, it has as a, a volume, its volume is just unit volume. So it is just unit volume of a solid material. And your objective is just to expose this material into certain force, whatever this force is. So there would be some deformation would result as we usually consider through this course because of the external force, we're gonna end up with some deformation. So this force, to exert this force, it means that you would be exerting some energy. So you could, you could consider that to, in order to deform this continuum body into a specific deformation or to or change the shape of this continuum into another shape, but within the elastic region or within the elastic behavior or limit of the material, you need some energy, you need some amount of energy. This amount of energy is the strain energy. Like assume you that you do have a continuum body again, and you have to subject this continuum into some energy, into some forces, or exert some energy over this continuum in order to change its shape from one shape to another shape, but within the elastic region. So what does it mean within the elastic region? It means that once we remove the applied force, this continuum will reset back again into, into its original shape one more time, right? So we need to do so to change the shape of the object, to do deformation to this continuum body. We need some energy. This amount of energy is the strain energy. But the strain energy density, this is the amount of energy needed for the whole continuum divided by its total volume. Or in other words, we can say that the strain energy density, this is the amount of energy needed to deform what a solid material or a solid body, its volume is just unity. 
like with unit volume, solid material, and we have to subject this material into some forces. It means that we have to exert some energy to deform this material. This energy is gonna be the strain energy density function. Make sense? So this strain energy density function, it is related to the strain, to the stress through this relation. Like the stress tensor, it is the partial derivative of the strain energy density function but with respect to the strain tensor. Well, th something that you should understand about this one, this is a function. It means that it is a field or a strain energy density field and it is a scalar quantity. It means that it, ha it has just magnitude. There is no direction for this value, but this one is the strain tensor. This, is, this epsilon is the strain tensor itself. And this is the stress tensor. So this is how the stress is, this is the general relation or expression like the stress it is related to the strain through, through this relation. Like the stress, it is the partial derivative or the description of how the strain energy of the material is going to change over the strain. So to explain this, this relation more to you, let us consider the simplest case, like the stress strain curve that we used to consider for the, uh, for the mechanics of material class. Like if we assume that this is epsilon and this is sigma, and we already have this elastic region, then we're gonna move to the yield point, then we're gonna have the plastic region as we dis as you already knew from the mechanics of material class. The focus right now is just over the elastic region, just focus over the elastic region. So the strain energy, it is simply the area, the strain energy in total, not the density one, the total strain energy, it should be the area under this curve, especially the under the linear curve, which is this line. So if we calculate this area, this is gonna be, give us some energy, which needed to bring this material into a certain epsilon. What is epsilon? This is a certain strain. So for example, how about if, so this is the stress strain curve for this material. How about if we would like to deform this material into just this value of epsilon? Like this is the value that we would like to attain. This is the amount of deformation that we would like to achieve for this material. So this requires a certain amount of stress, right? So the question is, how much of stress do we need to deform this material to achieve or to deform the material to achieve a certain strain, to achieve a certain strain to this material? How much it should be this sigma. This sigma it is somehow related to the epsilon through the area underneath this curve, this small curve here, this triangular area. This area it is U, let us give it a name U. This is the total, this is the total strain energy. This is the total strain energy of this material. Or this is the total amount of energy needed to deform the material into this epsilon. If we exert zero energy, it means that there is no epsilon, there is no deformation in the material, there is no strain. But to deform the material, we have to subject the material into some stresses. So what should be the stress in terms of epsilon that needed to deform the material into certain epsilon? This stress can be related to this epsilon through this relation. That it is how we are going to change the strain energy over epsilon. For example, if we need, if we need to deform more the material, if we assume that this is like epsilon one, how about if you would like to, to deform the material more into epsilon two? So you have to exert more energy. So that's why sigma one, it should be bigger, or sigma two, it should be bigger than sigma one. Why? Because we have to deform the material more. So we have to exert more stress. So you could consider that this relation or the stress simply, it is the variation, how the change or the rate of a change of the rate of a change. This is the strain rate of a change of the strain energy with respect to the strain. Like we would like to achieve a certain strain, how much of a stress that we need. This is going to be the derivative of the scalar quantity, which is the strain energy with respect to the strain. But here we need the strain energy density function. The strain energy density function W equals U over the volume of this continuum body, right? So this is, you could consider that W, this is the 
the strain energy density this is the total strain energy per unit volume of the continuum body and this is generally this is the source this is the origin thing of the constitutive you could consider that this is the constitutive equation right so we can say that this is mainly the constitutive equation for any continuum whatever it is whatever it is solid material fluid material viscoelastic material which is like kind of between the uh, solid and fluid material so generally speaking the constitutive equation it is something that relates the stress to the strain through the strain energy density function through this relation that sigma all the time it is the derivative of the the partial derivative of the strain with respect to the uh, this uh, the strain energy density function with respect to the strain tensor make sense so this is the constitutive equation but in the vector notation in the index notation in the index notation we used to represent the stress as sigma ij so partial w w it is not a tensor it is a scalar function just one equation scalar quantity divided by the strain which will be epsilon ij as well use the same indices as we use them for the sigma so for example if we said that sigma ij you have to use epsilon ij sigma j i j i k j k j the same index is typically the same but something that you should understand about sigma ij that it is typically the same as sigma j i and the same thing for epsilon ij it is typically the same like epsilon j i why because these two tensors as we discussed them the previous meetings they already symmetrical tensors each one has three six components only it means that the already symmetrical tensors so this is another form or this is the general form of the constitutive equation but in the index notation the constitutive equation right but someone would say that okay i didn't this is what be the first time for you to see this equation or the constitutive equation in this form in terms of the strain energy density function things right but we used to define the stress in terms of the strain, in terms of the mechanical properties of the material, like the Yang's modulus, like Hooke's law, the other material parameters as we are going to discuss. So, and this is our main interest, is to relate the stress to the strain through some other material coefficients. So to do so, we have to find an expression to the W, which is the strain energy density function. And this W would have different forms, depends on whatever you're already dealing with, a solid material, fluid material, or a viscoelastic material. Even this energy, it would be something that described the deformation or the amount of energy that needed to deform this material as we agreed or as we mentioned. But in fluid, for example, for solid material, our main focus or our main measure is just the deformation in the material. But in fluids, we may have some other deformation, other things more than just the deformation. In viscoelastic material, we may have a strain rate, for example, like the material deformation does, uh, the material deformation does not depend only on its deformation, but depend on the rate of deforming it. So there is like some other measure related to the strain, uh, strain rate. So we can have like strain energy density function will include some terms definitely that include that define that uh, define the material deformation in depend, uh, dependent dependent on its strain rate deformation okay but for solid material our main measure essential measure is just the deformation and we discussed that the deformation simply it describes the strain this is the symmetrical part of the deformation tensor and the rotation how this material is going to rigidly rotate make sense So, like a tentative example of the shape of the scalar quantity, which is the strain energy density function, this W, we can simply write this W add like, like W0. This W0, this is, this is like stored energy in the continuum. Like assume that you do have a continuum material that it is not necessary to be solid material. It would be any other material. And for some reason that this material has some energy already stored inside this energy at this innocent then you're gonna add more energy to this one to do to to deform the material and this is our main focus in the solid material this is like the concept of the capacitor how it works in the electrical systems 
in the capacitor, for example, like it would be charged, like the cell phone, the battery of your cell phone, like the battery to have some charge on you, then you're gonna charge more, add more charge to this battery, right? So it means that you're delivering more energy, more electrical power, if we are talking about the cell phones, right? The battery of the cell phone, it is looks like the same. Assume that this solid material like a battery and this material already having some charge, some stored energy as W0 already, already there. Then we're gonna add to this stored energy, some more energies also. Like, and this energy that needed to produce some deformation in the material. Our main focus is the deformation. And if you remember that we define the deformation tensor as F, this is the deformation tensor. So we can say that we do have C, which like a material constant, but it is in the tensorial form that is going to be multiplied times the this tensor. So there is like tensor multiplication to end up with the scalar quantities plus the, the plus another C, like you could say, could say that this is like C1, and we do have another material constant C2 times this is gonna be like the that product or is gonna be times the this tensor, the deformation tensor, like the multiplication, like the deformation tensor is so like F times F, but we are using here the double dot product because we would like to end up with this one as a scalar quantity, plus like C3, another constant, and times the F double dot, it would be a times F, it would be squared, for example. Squared plus whatever, like C4 times the F and so on, keep going, like bar four and so on. So assembly, you could, so this means assembly like, like for example, in this case, the strain energy, it is simply the area under this curve. And this curve, it is just a straight line. But generally speaking, this curve, it would be any other curve. It is not necessary to be linear. It would be any curve, whatever it is. So simply we can do like fitting or assuming that this curve, which is a nonlinear curve, like a polynomial function. So that's why we do have here like f bar zero, here we have f bar one, here is gonna be f squared, for example, or f squared, bar four, bar three, there should be like bar three, and so on. So you're gonna add more powers. It means that you already representing this one like a polynomial function. It is already a function, right? That's why it is a scalar quantity. It is a function that describe the area under this curve per unit volume of this continuum, right? So generally speaking, we could say that this is this strain energy density function, it would be any polynomial function, whatever it is, that describe the material under consideration that we're already considering. Make sense? And also something here that we should understand. We, as we discussed in the previous meeting, that this F, which is the deformation tensor, again, this, this is deformation tensor, right? And and this C's, which are the C1, C2, and so on, this C1 is a material constant. Material, or we could say that, let us just write this one generally, like C1, C2, and C3, and C4, all of these are material constants. Or material coefficients, we could name them as material coefficients, or some people would give them name as material stiffnesses, like this is the stiffness of the material itself. So all the are the same, but you should understand that these are tensors, like these things already tensors here. Like this is the material constant tensor. Make sense? And we're already having this deformation, this deformation tensor, which is F. This is just the deformation tensor, right? As we discussed before, the deformation tensor, it can be decomposed into two components, right? Into symmetrical part, into symmetrical component and, or two parts. The symmetrical part is the strain tensor and the screw symmetric part is the rotation tensor, if you remember, as we discussed before, right? So simply, if we decided to decompose this thing into strain and the strain and the rotation tensor, like, for example, let us pick these two functions, these two, these two terms. So decomposing F, F double dot F, which is the dot product, 
of a double dot product of this deformation tensor. So let us just work over this one here as F double dot F equals. F itself, it will be like epsilon plus theta tensor. We're already working in the vector form, uh, vector notation, double dot the F, which is epsilon plus theta, right? It doesn't matter if you just mention theta first, then epsilon, in a way, just sum them. Then if we decided to do double dot product, we can distribute because this is a sum and this is double dot, it can be distributed. So what does it mean? It means that we can have like epsilon double dot, just do the multiplication, like you already do, doing multiplication of epsilon double dot epsilon plus epsilon double dot theta. Like you already did multiplication of epsilon times epsilon, epsilon plus epsilon times theta. Then now we're going to do the multiplication of theta double dot epsilon plus theta double dot theta. Make sense? Something that is interesting, and you can try, try this one at home and to prove it, that this multiplication gives zero. This multiplication as well gives zero. Why? The reason is that this epsilon is a symmetrical tensor and the theta it is a skew symmetric tensor. So the dull product of two different tensors, one is symmetric, the second one is skew symmetric, gives zero. If you try it at home, you're going to find that their multiplication, their, their double dot product is going to give zero. The same thing for this one, right? This double dot product, it will be zero. So the double dot product, generally speaking, for any tensor that is a skew symmetric tensor is going to give zero, whatever by itself, or any other uh, symmetrical tensor, even, or even general tensor. So it's going to give zero. And this makes sense. It means that this double dot product is going to give us just epsilon, only epsilon. The same thing here, that it means that this term can be replaced by epsilon, double dot epsilon, and this term can be replaced by epsilon double dot epsilon. So as you can see, we're going to end up, even this one, if we just consider this one, this one is going to be decomposed into symmetric part plus the skew symmetric part. So as you can see, we do have some energy that is stored energy that already used for giving rotation to the continuum, right? So if we decided to write this W, W is going to be W0, which is just the initial energy, the stored energy in the continuum, plus C1, but double dot the F, or this tensor, you could consider this is like a constant, whatever it is. So we can have, even we can forget about the double dot, just eliminate, remove the double dot here for this one, epsilon plus theta, just to, to make it more general, plus the C2 times this F double dot F is going to give us the epsilon. It had been reduced to epsilon double dot epsilon plus C3 times epsilon double dot epsilon bar squared. And we're going to have like C4 plus C4, the epsilon double dot epsilon bar to three. And we, we're going to end up and, and so on as we keep moving, depending on the polynomial function that describe the material that best fit the material that we already considering. Make sense? So you could consider that this is a tentative shape or formula of the strain energy density function. Again, this epsilon, this is a stored energy. This is like initial energy or stored energy, stored energy in the continuum. And this is, this is like some material constants. And as you can see, in this strain energy density function, we're having this term that include the epsilon, which is the strain, and the theta, right? But how about these terms, this F and this F? As you can see, we have proved that this sigma theta term, their double dot is going to give zeros in terms of the index and the tensor notation or uh, 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 tensor calculus itself. But does this make sense or not? Yes, it do make sense. Why? Because what is the definition of the strain energy? It is even, that's why people give it a name as a strain energy. But generally speaking from the thermodynamics, that this epsilon generally, it should be any kind of energy. It is not just, it, it is not necessary to be just a strain energy. You got my point? Like this epsilon, this energy, it would be any stored energy or any energy that you give to this material. This energy would be in the form of magnetic force or magnetic field 
or thermal field, like thermal energy, or it would be in the form of some forces. It means that this is mechanical energy, which is known as the strength energy. So the strength energy, it is one form of the energy that comes through to the material, but through forces. This is the strength energy, and the objective of this energy is just to give deformation, is to give strain to the material. So that's why, so generally to give us deformation, but the deformation, it has rotation and the strain. As you can see, the strain terms has been eliminated, and we just left or kept to only with the strain component. So that's why it is commonly known as the strain energy function. But generally speaking, as I mentioned, it would be any type of energy. But the focus here on the linear elasticity course, on the deformation of solid material, and this deformation, it will be perfectly described through the strain. And that's why, as I showed here up there, that we, all of these theta terms will be eliminated to end up with just epsilons that indicate that this is strain energy function. But we still have this theta term, right? And the other question, why, we, why these theta, uh, the, the, uh, the theta terms, the rotation tensors had been eliminated from this equation? Does this make sense or not? Yes, it do make sense. Why? Because the strain energy function, we are seeking the function that, or the amount of energy that needed to give deformation in the, in the material, right? And the perfect thing to describe the deformation or the change in the shape of the material is the strain. But as you remember that the rotation, it gives rigid rotation to the continuum, but it does not describe any deformation or any change in the shape of the material. Deformation is a change in the shape or dimensions or a change in the rotation, like you give rotation. The rotation does not include any deformation of the material, or I'm sorry, does not include any change in the shape or the dimensions of the material. And the strain energy, we mean that we are interested with the deformation. So that's why we need the epsilon. And this makes sense. And this is what we already got, that this theta, double dot theta, theta term is already eliminated because the rotation does not contribute to the strain energy of the material. But the question is, why do we still have epsilon here? Does this make sense? Yes, it makes sense in some cases. Why? Because this theta term that already included into this term, because you probably may subject the material into some forces, and these forces will not give deformation in the material or a change in the shape, but it's going to give rotation in the continuum. So it means that you exerted some energy to give rotation to the continuum, yes. So that's why we're already having this theta will be shown here. Because for example, this is like you already having a continuum body and you're gonna subject this continuum object, solid material into some forces. But for some reason, this material is going to move. It's going to roll over the surface and in the meanwhile, it's going to deform. So after all, it, it had, it attained another shape, but another location. So it rotated. So there should be theta ij. In addition, it had been deformed. So there should be epsilon ij. Change it in terms of the shape and the dimension. So we do have both. So it means that part of this force, it has been consumed or used for giving rotation into the continuum. But the other part of the force will, had been used for giving deformation or a change in the shape of the continuum, right? So this force can be converted into energy. The force can be, it is like kind of energy or related to the energy. So as you exert more force, it means that you're already exerting more energy. So what does it mean? I give some energy, part of this energy had been used to give rigid rotation and the other part had been used into the deformation in the continuum. So that's why I should have at least one term that include the rotation of the continuum, which is already included here, right? To give like kind of rotation in, for this continuum material. Make sense? So this is generally speaking, what does it mean the strain energy or the energy? This is like internal stored energy or the internal energy of the continuum. W0 again, this is like initial stored energy and this sigma uh, th theta in addition to epsilon, these are the total deformation that because of the external force in addition to the other terms, as you can see, the rotation tensor had been eliminated from this equation, right? So, so again, this is the strain energy. And as I mentioned, this is like a tentative shape in the tensorial form or the vector notation 
analysis, but it is preferred to write this strain energy. So this is the form of the strain energy that we're gonna use. So here we're gonna talk the about the strain energy, energy density, but in the index notation. This is the form of the strain energy that we basically can consider. Then there is one more simplification that we I'm gonna discuss here. So we could consider that W it is C0, and you're gonna consider that this C0, this is like works like the stored energy in the continuum kind of, or like W0, you can let us use the same term. The W0 plus the Cij, Epsilon ij plus like uh, another term which it should be like um, you know like uh, the c par ij theta ij because we already having here this term like this is c1 I'm gonna give because this is epsilon ij this is second order tensor multiply times a second order tensor so the and this should be like dot product here so this should be also second order tensor so if this is epsilon ij it should be epsilon ij theta ij so it would be multiplied times another theta cij which is this constant or material constant or material coefficient is different than this one both are different material coefficients one is conjugate to the epsilon the other one is conjugate to the theta which is the rotation tensor plus we do have here C, another tensor, but this is the multiplication of dot, double dot product of the epsilon times epsilon. So this is gonna give us like epsilon, ij epsilon, this term will be epsilon ij epsilon kl. So we should have here a tensor. This tensor is gonna be like one over two. This is the product two of the C, i, j, k, l. This is another tensor, but this tensor is the fourth order tensor. This is a second order tensor, second order, this is a fourth order tensor. This is the material coefficient. It's commonly known as the material constant or the material coefficient matrix or tensor of the material. Plus, so this is like we're already considering this term. This term we're gonna consider like square. So the square is gonna give like a third multiplication here. So this would be represented like one over three, the dot the product of three uh, times C, I, J, K, L, like I, J, K, L, M, N. So this is, as you can see, this is six order tensor times Epsilon, I, J, this, the first two indices, Epsilon, K, L, the second two indices, and we already having here the Epsilon, M, N, and so on. As we keep going, we're going to have further. So this is like the polynomial function that describe the strain energy of a certain continuum material, right? This one is a strain energy. This is the strain energy, strain energy. Density function, but for, for a nonlinear, nonlinear, Elastic material. Elastic material. So what does it mean a nonlinear mat elastic material? Also, this course it is linear elasticity. So if the difference, a big difference, very quick difference between linear elastic material and nonlinear elastic material in this case. Like if we consider the stress strain curve of a linear material and linear elastic material within the elastic region. You're gonna find we used to have like straight line within the elastic region, then we're gonna move to the plastic region, whatever it is, and the plastic region typically takes like a curve, right? Till the fraction point. So within the elastic region, we do have a linear relation. This is the elastic part. This is the elastic part. And as you can see, there is a linear relation. This is linear elastic material. Why? Because the relation or the stress is related to the strain through the linear elastic. Uh, stress strain curve. So this is linear elastic material. But this one, like if we consider like we do have a material, whatever it is, like this is the elastic region, and then we do have a yield, 
beyond that, the material is going to move to a plastic deformation, whatever it is, right? So generally, this material within the elastic region, it behaves nonlinear. There is a nonlinear relation between the sigma and epsilon. This is within the elastic part or region of the material. So we're going to say that this is linear elastic, linear elastic material, right? Material. And it means that this expression is a general expression of the strain energy density function for a nonlinear material, and we have to add more terms as needed to perfectly fit this curve. Like if this curve is just like that, so we would have like just two terms or three terms or 10 terms. It depends on the curve of this or how severely or the level of the nonlinearity in this material, right? As we have more nonlinearity, we have to add more terms here, right? So this is, generally speaking, how the general form of the strain energy density function, whatever it is for nonlinear material or linear elastic material. For a linear elastic material, as you can see, we should end up with a linear relation between sigma and epsilon. And to do so, we have to eliminate any higher order terms of the strain higher than two. I mean, like, like this term, like up to this term, it's gonna give us linear elastic material. Beyond that, any other term that you add, it means that you're gonna consider a nonlinear material. So for a linear elastic material, we're gonna end up with just this term, this term, and this term, and this term, and that's it. Just, this is just for a linear elastic material. So we could say that for a linear, for linear elastic, Material and that's why the name of this course is linear elasticity linear elasticity It means that we are assuming that this continuum material it is made of a material This continuum body is made of a material. This material is linear elastic material So what does it mean linear elastic material? It means that its stress is related to the strength through linear relation within the elastic region And this is the thing that we're gonna focus or you through this course so it means that eliminating any higher order terms, like starting from this term and, and beyond, that all of these terms will be considered or disregarded because we're already working as linear elasticity and we're just going to consider the, the other terms. So we're going to end up with W, which is the strain energy density function equals W0, which is the store energy plus the Cij, epsilon Ij plus the Cij bar, theta ij which is the rotation tensor plus the one over two because the one uh, the two product is going to be just two the c i j k l times epsilon i j epsilon k l this is going to give us the shape of the strain energy function but for linear elastic material and this is what we're going to consider make sense so far and remember that these are different material constants that these c's are these common known as material coefficients or material constants. As I mentioned, some people would give them a name as material stiffnesses or material stiffness. Make sense? So going back again, so since we already have like a tentative shape of or form of the strain energy density function, especially for linear elastic material, and this is going to be the focus of this course. How much or what is the form of the sigma in terms of epsilon? We need to form the constitutive equation. So simply we're going to use this expression. Sigma is going to be the partial derivative of W with respect to the strain, and this is what we are going to do here for this part. So simply, we're going to say that sigma ij, it should equal to the partial derivative of w with respect to the epsilon ij. So doing so, so if you try to find the derivative of the first term, the first term is just constant term. This is constant term. Why? Because this is like initial, initially stored energy within this continuum. And anyway, it is constant. It does not depend on the strain, right? So it's derivative with respect to the strain is going to give us zero. So the first term is simply zero. How about the derivative of the second term? It's going to give us like Cij because you're already doing derivative of this term 
with respect to epsilon. So this is like C times X, and you're already differentiating with respect to X. So this is gonna give us the conic. This is a constant value. This is a material property that do depend on the material type, like the Young's model, the Poisson's ratio. But this is not just the Young's model, so the Poisson's ratio of the material. There are lots of things that would be included in the, inside the C or the Cs in general. So these are material constants. It means that they don't depend on the strain. They only depend on the uh, material type. And this is what basically any natural material is already doing. Like for any natural material, we do have certain material properties within the elastic region, which are the C's, which are constant for any material type, as long as we are talking about natural material. But now we can do some more advanced materials like metamaterial, for example, and we may have the material properties to bend on the strain. So we'll, in this case, we're going to have derivative of this term will be differentiated with respect to the strain. But we don't have this case for now. We already assuming that this C is already constant because they do gonna do constant for all natural materials. And we're gonna do the derivative just for, this is gonna be our main variable. So this is gonna give us the Cig for the second term. The third term is gonna be zero because why we're already differentiating with respect to the epsilon. Make sense? Someone would say why I did why I didn't differentiate with the theta as well. For example, I can do derivative to the epsilon plus theta ij. It means that you're gonna differentiate with the with respect to the deformation tensor or the deformation tensor itself, right? But if if you remember from our formulation of the equations of motion from the discrete system of particles, we uh, we proved that the skew symmetric part of this stress tensor it should be zero. And this is skew-symmetric barter is conjugate to the C, to the theta term. It means that we have to do, to, to do derivative with respect to the strain. And that's why we, this one is commonly known as the strain energy density function. But what I'm presenting here, this is not the strain energy density function. What I'm presenting here, this is totally, this is the internal energy in the continuum. Why? Because it includes some stored energy, some other energies that related to the rotation. So generally speaking, this is the internal energy. So if we decided to differentiate this one, which just with respect to the strain, because this is the thing that describes the change in the shape and the dimension of the continuum as we agreed. There is no contribution for the rigid rotation within the linear elasticity things. So that's why this, we're already differentiating with epsilon, with respect to epsilon, and this term will be automatically zero, right? Plus the, plus the other term here, which is one over two, then let us seek the derivative. Here we already differentiating with the multiplication of two functions, right? So this derivative is gonna be split over two terms. The first term, the half is just constant, even the Cij care is, it should be constant. But if we already differentiate with respect to the epsilon Ij, so this is gonna give us Cij, KL, right, times the epsilon KL, because you already do derivative with respect to one, so you could consider this is like X and this is like Y. So, and differentiate with respect to X. So this is gonna give us C times Y, and that's it, right? Now let us do, do the derivative to the other term. Now we have, so this is the derivative of the first term plus the times the second term, plus the derivative of the second term. Now we have to do the derivative over epsilon KL. But change, you have to observe the change in the index, that we have to change the index here. What is working as epsilon IJ? So I decided to, to, to do the changes here. We have to change this index to be IJ, so it would be consistent with this derivative. And we're gonna have here KL, then it means that we have to switch these two indices, the KL IJ. You got my point? Because I have to do derivative with respect to the epsilon ij. So that's why, that's fine to change the indices. So if we did so and we work over these new indices, we're going to end up with this term plus another term. The c, it became like c k l ij. And this epsilon, we're going to differentiate with this epsilon. So we're going to end up with the epsilon k l. Make sense? And that's it. So these are the derivatives. So we're gonna end up with this sigma ij. This is the constitutive equation. C ij, and then we're gonna talk about this one, plus one over two. As you can see, I can consider this epsilon kl as a common factor, right? 
So having this one as a common factor, this is gonna give us like one over two times the CIJKL plus the CKLIJ times the epsilon KL. As you can see, this term is the symmetric part. This is the symmetric part. This is the symmetric, like a symmetric part of, this is like a symmetric part of the CIJKL, the fourth order. Not all of it, just like a, a symmetrical properties, like a special form of this CIJKL, right? So I can replace this one if we even if we even consider this one. Let us consider this one like with a hat, and this is gonna be with a hat here, with a hat, with a hat, and with a hat. So I can combine these two into just one C, into uh, just one uh, an equivalent C. So I can write this one into this expression like sigma i j equals the C i j plus one over two. This all of this. Term, which is 1 over 2 CIJ KL plus this term will be replaced by the CIJ KL. I used here hat, it means that this C tensor is different than this one, right? This one is the symmetric part, kind of the symmetric part of this tensor times the epsilon KL. And this is gonna give us the constitutive equation. This is gonna be the constitutive equation. This is the constitutive equation that we are seeking right but we do have a term here which is this one so as you can see this term it should be stress this term it should be stressed why it should be stressed because it should be the same index the same unit at this one this is sigma so this should be sigma all of this it should be sigma right so this is stress what is this is stress? this is just like stored stress known as the residual this is the residual stress this is the residual stress that would be stored within the material even before we subject the material into some forces and i'm pretty sure that you had an idea about the residual stresses or even you heard this term before you have an idea about this term before even from the design uh, uh, course or from the manufacturing course Residual stresses is any kind of embedded stresses that already stored inside the material without exposing the material into force. So when we try to expose the material into more stresses, it means that the material is became stressed more. This residual stress, it is not preferred in terms of the practical use of this material in the different application. One of the reasons of the residual stress would be the manufacturing method. We would use a manufacturing method of making the material and this manufacturing will would result in some residual stresses that would be stored inside the crystal structure of the material. So when we subject the material into some forces or more stresses, so the material will be stressed more than we are expecting. It, ma it makes sense? So this is the residual stress, and it makes sense that we ignore this term, assuming that we are going to manufacture the material in a perfect way to eliminate any kind of residual stresses and this is basically what we'll try to do in terms of manufacturing when we've manufactured the material or prepared the material we are using methods of manufacturing that eliminate the residual that would be stored within the material so in many of the cases these residual stresses are very negligible or they don't exist there is the 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 basic idea of don't exist it is not, uh, this is the ideal case. But anyway, if there is some residual stresses, they are very negligible to the amount of stress that we are going to add to the material. So these are the additional stresses that we are going to add to this material further over the residual stress. So ignoring this one, neglecting this one, can be neglecting, can be neglected. So we're gonna end up with this expression of the residual stresses like sigma ij, equals C I J K L times the epsilon I J, I'm sorry, epsilon K L. This is gonna give us the constitutive equation for linear elastic material. These are the constitutive equations, but for these are the constitutive equations for linear elastic material. And this is what we're gonna do through this course. This is the type, the form of the constitutive equation in general that we're gonna consider through this course. Make sense? 
Now let us write this constitutive equation into like the explicit form of the constitutive equation. Like this is the index notation, the sigma ij again as epsijkl, the epsilon kl. So how about if we are interested in finding the xx? As you remember that this is resistance, so it should be six components, right? It tends, this tends to have six components. So how about the xx component? It means that ij became xx, so we're gonna enforce xx to the ij, but the kl, it will be like dummy index. Like these two indices, each one will be a dummy index. It means that it should be repeated. So if we decided to repeat this one, this is gonna give us at the end six terms because this epsilon, it has six components. We do have epsilon xx, we do have epsilon xy, we do have epsilon yy, and so on. But generally speaking, something that you should understand about these C's, that this term, this epsilon will be split into nine terms, not just one term. I, so as, as I'm gonna show you, so we do have here epsilon, CXX, the KL, now we're gonna work over Epsilon XX. So we're gonna have XX, Epsilon XX. This is the first term plus. Now let us consider Epsilon YY. So we're gonna have the CXX, X, uh, YY. So the KL will be YY. So this is gonna give us Epsilon YY. Then ZZ, so we're gonna have the CXX, ZZ, and Epsilon ZZ. Make sense? Plus, now let us consider the Epsilon XY. Within the strain tensor, if we just consider the strain tensor itself, how many terms that, how many components that include sig epsilon xy? We do have epsilon xy here, and we do have another epsilon xy here. So it means that the epsilon xy is double, not just one. Here we do have epsilon xz, the same thing for the epsilon xz. We do have epsilon yy, epsilon yz, we do have epsilon xz, we do have epsilon yz and epsilon zz so the diagonal components xx yy and zz only single components but the off diagonal components each one is doubled originally in the tensor we'd have epsilon xy and we'd have epsilon yx but since they are symmetrical so they already equal the same thing for the z component so that's why we showed when we split this one we have to split it into two terms as well you got my point so we can have here like like C, X, X, and we're gonna have here the X, Y, Epsilon, X, Y. Then we're gonna have the C, X, X, but Y, X. Epsilon, Y, X, which should, be, this term, it should be identical. It should be the same term, right? Plus D. The same thing, for example, for the Epsilon, X, 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 Z, Epsilon, X, Z, then plus the C, X, X, zx epsilon zx plus the cxx yz epsilon yz plus the cxx uh, zy the epsilon the epsilon zy and yes so that's it these are nine components one two three times three this is going to give us the nine component as you can see these two terms are identical so we can combine them and multiply times two these two terms are identical. We can combine them and multiply times two, right? These two. And these two terms also are identical. You got it? So let me use just different colors here. That these two terms, this term and this term, they're already identical. So we can combine them. The same thing for these two terms already identical. Okay, so this is for sigma xx. How about sigma, epsilon, uh, sigma yy? Sigma yy equals we're gonna do the same so it's gonna be the c but y y and the kl epsilon kl then we're gonna repeat nine times so this is gonna give us the sig the sigma the c y y and uh, we're gonna have here the xx epsilon xx plus the c y y y y epsilon y y plus the c y y z z epsilon z z plus the the C, Y, Y, X, Y, and Epsilon, X, Y, and there is Y, X, which should be repeated. So we agreed that we can, we're going to multiply it times two. And also we can have like two C, Y, Y, but X, Z, 
epsilon xz because it should be repeated plus two times the cyyyz epsilon yz. Make sense? So this is gonna give us the nine component after we already combined these two uh, identical terms into one term. Make sense? And if we did so, for example, like sigma xy is gonna be the cxy and xx epsilon xx plus and so on. So you're gonna end up also with other nine terms and there are some of the terms that should be combined together. So as you can see, we can express or write this for linear elastic material, this sigma in terms of the strain, so this is the stress strain relation, but generally for any material, whatever it is, here we are talking about the material that it is a very general material. And as you can see, we're gonna end up with so many material coefficients. Every one of these components, this is a material constant, and this is another material constant, this is another material constant. So this tensor, this tensor, it has this tensor, this one has 48 material constants in, in general. Why? Because it should be the three bar to four. It should be the three bar to four. So if you did the multiplication or this operation, three power, this math is gonna give us 40, uh, 81. I'm sorry, it should be like 81 material constants, right? So it means that we should have 81 material constant for this material. What material constant like Young's modulus, for example. If we're gonna talk about the Young's modulus and Basson's ratio, these are only two material constants for a special type of material. But here we are talking in general, generally speaking, for any material, whatever it is, that in general, we should have 81 material constant. But this tensor actually, it has some specifications, some of the properties. What it is that this epsilon, this C, I, J, K, L, it equals to C, K, L, I, J, equals to C, I, J, I, K, L, equals to C, I, J, L, K. So what does it mean? It has some symmetry, and this is what we have proved here, right? We proved that this one is a symmetrical tensor, right? So what does it mean? It means that the component, it, that is fine if we switch this to, two indices, with these two indices, we are gonna end up with the same tensor. No, nothing is going to change to this tensor. And it looks like we said that epsilon ij equals to epsilon gi. It means that they already symmetric, so it is kind of the same, right? Also, if we switch between these two indices or these two indices, it's fine, why? Because basically, it should be multiplied by a symmetrical tensor. So by default, over these two indices, it should be symmetrical. Also, these two indices are symmetric. So these two as well, it should be symmetric. So what does it mean symmetric? It means that it's fine to switch between them. That is fine if you said that if I, J or J, I, like this one, or K, L or L, K. So they are identical. So this will reduce the total number from 81 to only two, 21 material coefficients, or to only 21 material coefficients will be remaining for this material tensor. So under this condition, under this condition, that this tensor, generally speaking, general, in general, it should be 81 material constants. But some of these constants will be similar, will be identical, will be the same, based on this condition. So this will reduce the number of the material coefficients into only 21 material coefficients. But 21 material coefficients tell a huge number of material constants that probably we don't know them for many materials, right? Any material, if we are talking about the steel material, most of the isotropic material that we're already using, they do have only two material constants, as I'm gonna show you. But generally, this tensor, it should be, it should have, it should have 21 independent material constants that should be, they, they should be different, right? So if we decided to write the stress tensor components, we can write them in this form. So as you can see, we do have so many material constants. What I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna give you another form, not another form, it is typically the same, like, but more compact form or more simplified form of the stress in terms of the strain using this C tensor, this general tensor, but based on something that we call as engineering notation or white, the white uh, Kelvin notation. So for this type of notation, it is like make the writing more easy because as you can see, when I write this C, it is C, X, 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 X. 
and the CXXYY. So the, the lots of indices that we're already using and we don't need them. So one of the things basically is to assume these notations, is to assume these things. Let us assume these notations. Assume that XX is just one and the YY is just two and the ZZ is just three and the YZ is four and the XZ is five and the XY is six. Just assume this number, like assume any double index, like XX is just one, just put it one. YY just put it two. So if I decided to do so here, so simply this sigma XX, I can write this one as sigma one. Here, this one is gonna be like sigma C, XX is gonna be like C1. And KL, KL, forget about this term for now, just move to this these terms. Like here we do have here, this two XX will be one, and the other two XX will be one. So we can end up with just C11, and instead of writing C, X, 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 just four X's, very lots of typing, right, of writing. So it became more simple, C11, right? And this one, this epsilon, is, it became like epsilon one. This one is gonna be like epsilon one, C one and two, because why, why it became two. This one is gonna be epsilon two. And here we're gonna have like one and three. And this is gonna be epsilon three. This one is gonna be one, but six, because X, Y, we assumed it six. And this is gonna give us six here. And this one is gonna be like, one and x, y, or y, x, they are identical, so it should be six, and this should be six as well. The same thing here, we can have like one, and this x, z, it is five, and five, and so on. So this is gonna make the writing more simple, right? It's gonna make it more simple. Like you can simply write, like sigma one is gonna be one, 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 two, two, one, three, three, and so on. You got my point? So it, it, it became more simple, kind of. But there is also something that you have to consider, like this case, we're gonna say that this is like six and this is like two. And here we're gonna have like, like six. But how about this two? This two, we're gonna combine it. So we're gonna assume according to these things, we can assume these things. Like we do have six component of the stresses, right? We'd have sigma xx, we'd have sigma yy, so sigma x, x we're gonna assume that this one is sigma one and this one is sigma two. And sigma z, z, we're gonna assume this one like sigma z, I'm sorry, sig sigma three. And sigma x, y, we're gonna assume that this one as uh, sigma, I'm sorry, I forgot about x, y, 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 z, is just sigma uh, four. And sigma x, z is sigma, five and sigma y z x y is gonna be sigma six right and then this is for the sigmas for the strains for the epsilon we already having here epsilon x x and we do have epsilon y y and we do have epsilon z z so this one is gonna be epsilon one this is gonna be epsilon two this is gonna be epsilon three and the epsilon y z but double of it, the double of epsilon yz2, just consider this two into account. This is gonna give us as epsilon four. So epsilon four, it should be double yz, epsilon yz. And the double of epsilon xz, it should, it should give us the epsilon five. And the double of epsilon xy, it should be the epsilon six. So assuming these things, and we can arrange this equation into a matrix form. Right, we can, this is like a first row. This is the first row, the first equation. So it's gonna be like sigma one equals six C11 times epsilon XX. So we can arrange these equations into a tensorial form, into a matrix form. So we're gonna have here like a vector. Here we're gonna have like sigma one, sigma two. Remember that sigma one is conjugate to sigma XX. Sigma three, this is like sigma ZZ. Sigma four, this is sigma YZ sigma five and sigma six, right? Then we're gonna have here some matrix in the middle. 
in this way and we're gonna have this epsilon 1 epsilon 2 epsilon 3 epsilon 4 epsilon 5 and epsilon 6 and remember that these epsilons these are the original in terms of epsilon x x and y, epsilon y y and so on so these are the still the same stress component the sixth component of the stress and the stress the sixth component of the strain and they should be related through these different material coefficients so this is gonna give us here a matrix c big matrix how how much of the size of this matrix this one it is six times one right it is six row times one and this six times one vector or matrix so this matrix in the middle it should be six times six so it should have 36 components that should be distributed for this c, c matrix and this one is commonly known in this form is commonly known as the uh, material or the stiffness matrix is commonly known as the stiffness matrix this is the stiffness material stiffness matrix okay matrix right and this matrix should include all the material constants or all the material properties this tensor it should include all of these c11 c12 so as you can see instead of writing c with four indices we're gonna write all of these c's with just two indices right this new form of the notation is known as engineering notation this this form of the notation matrix it is used a lot by engineers so that's why it is commonly known as engineering this is the engineering notation notation of the constitutive equation the constitutive equation also it is known as the virt Kelvin, Kelvin notation. Okay. So I'm going to give you the details of this matrix, how much, uh, how it looks like. But remember that sigma one, it should be sigma x, x, sigma y, y, sigma z, z, sigma y, z, sigma x, z, sigma x, y. Here, this epsilon, this should, should be double of epsilon y, z. This should be the double of epsilon xy. This should be double of epsilon xz, and so on. So you have to acknowledge these different things. You don't deal, and you shouldn't deal with these epsilons. Epsilon y1 up to six, sigma one up to six, that they are like different things. No, they still the same stress components, but with different form. With not different form, basically a different notation, right? Which is known as the engineering notation or by the uh, Kelvin notation. All right, so all right, so this is gonna be the shape of the or the different components, the three sixty components of the six times six uh, matrix of the stiffness matrix. So this is commonly known as the stiffness. This is the stiffness stiffness matrix of the material. Since we are talking about engineering things. So this is gonna be the stiffness matrix of this material, and these are the strain components, and this this is the this stress component. So we can write this engineering notation as sigma i, where i stands for one, two, three, and so on, equals c i j, where this it would be like i and j epsilon i, or epsilon, oh, yeah, it should be uh, epsilon j. So it is c i j epsilon j. This is for the index, the engineering notation for the constitutive equation. So the previous one, and this is the original one, the original uh, index notation things, which should be this one. This expression, this is the general one that used by the uh, more scientific, this is more academic thing. But in terms of engineering, the engineers, they found that it is, this thing is more practical to be used and it is used especially for by civil engineer, mechanical engineer. So this is an engineering concept. Even this stiffness matrix, which includes so many material parameters, some of these material parameters, as I mentioned before, it would be repeated, would be identical. 
or like this C12, it would be equal to the C21. Uh, so we're gonna reduce this 336, it will be reduced further depending on the material type. So for example, for orthotropic material, for orthotropic, this is one of the material, and I'm gonna let you know what does it mean orth orthotropic material for ortho. Orthotropic material. Orthotropic material, this material, it should have different properties along two different directions. Like, for example, if we're going to have a plate like this one, and we decided for some reason to test this plate under tension to come up with its elastic models, for example. So if we tested this material, this plate along this direction, and we measured the Young's modulus, we're gonna find it with a certain value, and we decided to switch into the other, the transverse direction, we're gonna end up with a different value. So this is commonly known as orthotropic material. So orthotropic material, it means that the material will have different properties when measured along two orthogonal directions, or two perpendicular directions. Along direction one and direction two, we're gonna end up with different material properties. This is commonly known as the orthotropic material. For this orthotropic material, this material matrix would be reduced further, right? But there is something here that I forgot to tell you about it, which is this S. So as you can see, we do have sigma as a function of epsilon. So if epsilon is already given to us and we are interested to find sigma, so we can simply multiply epsilon times the stiffness matrix, we can simply end up with the sigma components, right? Like for example, sigma one, it's gonna be the C11 times epsilon one plus C12 times the epsilon two, C13 times epsilon plus C14 and so on. So you're gonna end up with the sigma one. Sigma two is gonna be the same. So assembly to find using this expression, this matrix form, to find sigma, the stress in terms of, for a given strain, it's gonna be more, uh, it's gonna be simple, right? But how about if the stress is the one that is given and we are interested in the strain, so we have to come up with the inverse of this matrix. The inverse of the stiffness matrix is commonly known as the convenience matrix. So this is gonna give us the S. So we could say that this is epsilon I equal the Sij sigma J. And this one, this C S is the inverse, the Sij, this is the inverse or matrix. This is the inverse of the Cij matrix. And this is commonly known as the compliance matrix. The compliance matrix. That simply if the stress is given and you already have an idea about this S matrix, you can simply come up with the epsilon, epsilon one, for example, is gonna be S11 times sigma one plus S12 times sigma two and so on. You can calculate these different components of the strain, right? So as I mentioned here, let me just move these things down because this should belong to the orthotropic motion. So for, ortho, for uh, orthotropic material, so I'm just gonna move this one down. So for orthotropic material, this is gonna be the form. As you can see, there are lots of C terms already eliminated, had been removed. So one of the specification of the orthotropic material, again, what is orthotropic material? This is the material that exhibit different mechanical or elastic properties when it is tested or measured along two perpendicular directions. So that's why the name of orthotropic or orthogonal material. So for this material, the C16, the stiffness component C16 equals C26 equals C36, all the six components in addition to the C45, all are zeros. All of these components are zeros. So simply, it means that within this general matrix, this component, it should be zero, this component, this one six and two six component, the three six component, in addition, so there are lots of components that will be eliminated. So eliminating and in addition, there are more actually that should be eliminated so yeah so this should be zero in addition to the all the component that related to the five so as you can see this in addition to the c25 and the c24 uh, two, uh, three five and the, th and the c15 so there are lots of components that shall be eliminated so this is going to be the only remaining components 
C11, C12, C13, and these will be different values, but the others are zero. This is gonna give us the stiffness matrix, but for ortho orthotropic material, and this is gonna be the compliance matrix for the, the this uh, orthotropic material. Make sense? Now let us move to the thing that we're gonna focus on here, which is the isotropic material. This orthotropic material, for example, or orthogonal material, we're gonna need it or use it for the case, for example, of composite plates or composite material. For composite material, its properties along two different dimensions are already different. So, or is or it could be considered, uh, it could be named as anisotropic material. This material, it could be considered anisotropic material. Anisotropic material is the one that like the orthotropic material, its properties along two different directions are different. But the isotropic material, and this is the thing that we're gonna focus on. Like, as I mentioned, if you have a plate or a pulp material like a box, like this one, this material, and it, you try to measure its mechanical properties, along this direction, like the Young's models along this direction, or you measure the Young's models in this direction, or even you measure the Young's models along this direction, is gonna be the same. So this elastic, this material, is commonly known as isotropic material. So what is isotropic material? This is the material that exhibits the same mechanical properties or elastic properties in all directions. Whatever the direction, even if you try to stretch the material within this direction, like a diagonal direction, you're gonna end up with the same mechanical properties. But if you're gonna end up with different properties, this indicate anisotropic material, like anisotropic material, or just isotropic material, this is the isotropic one that we're gonna focus on here. One of the specifications, or the C matrix, and we're gonna work on over this tensor. So we said that the sigma ij equals the C i j k l times epsilon k l. So what I've presented above here, I've presented, I've just showed you different notations of the stress tensor, but basically we're gonna use them a lot through this course since we are already working academic things. But this notation, as I mentioned, because you probably, when you try to search for something, you're gonna find these indices. So you should understand what does it mean, the C11 and C12. So this C11, it should be like CXXXX. This C12 should be C epsilon C, uh, it should be CXX. Uh, X, Y, uh, no, Y, Y, and so on. So you now we already have an idea what does it mean, the Cs, and how they would be related to the general stiffness or the material coefficient matrix, which is this C, I, J, K, L, and this is the form that we're gonna depend a lot through this course. For isotropic material, the C, I, J, K, L equals, for isotropic material, equals lambda times the delta I, J, delta I, J, this is the chronicle delta, and delta KL plus the mu and delta IK, delta JL plus another mu, the same mu, delta IL, delta JK. What is these deltas? These are the chronicle deltas. And again, this is the stiffness matrix. This is the material matrix. This is the material uh, coefficient, coefficient tensor. So now we're gonna use tensor, but this C and this S, these were matrices. This is the engineering thing, but here we're already working like academic thing using the tensor notation. So this is the material coefficient tensor for, but for isotropic material. But for isotropic material. So as you can see, this tensor we mentioned above that this tensor include 25, 21 different material coefficients in general. For isotropic material, these 21 material coefficients reduced only into two material coefficients. Only two, because this mu is identical like this one. This lambda and mu, this lambda and mu are commonly known as lambda constants. Would the guy already First, introduce these constants, right? These lambda constants, they could be related, they are related to the Young's models of the material and the Boisson's ratios through certain relations as we're gonna explain these things. And I'm gonna show you this relation. But let us investigate this relation of the C. And let us substitute this one into the general constitutive, this is the constitutive, constitutive equation in general, right? So substituting back here into this one, we're gonna end up with this expression of the sigma 
IJ equals. If you apply this one, the first term will be epsilon, uh, lambda, delta IJ, right? Delta KL times, this is the first term. This should be multiplied times the epsilon KL. Epsilon KL. Plus, the second term is going to be the mu times the delta times the delta IK times the delta JL this all should be multiplied times the epsilon KL plus the second term which is mu delta I think yeah it is uh, should be IL delta KJ right or K uh, or JK it is still the same epsilon KL so now let us investigate this delta. So according to this term, that delta KL, it means that this should be the same index. You have to use the same index for both. So let us use RR. For example, to get rid of this delta, we have to use the same index for both K and L. Like let us use any repeated index like LRR or KK or LL, it doesn't matter. Like you can use even, for example, LL or KK. So I can write this one as sigma IJ equals lambda. Delta IJ, you just nothing to do with epsilon uh, with delta IJ, but this one you just gonna get to get rid of this epsilon uh, delta KL. Your objective is just to use the same index for both K and L. It means that you can use like KK or LL. Let us use KK for example. Plus the second term mu. We do have delta IK and we do have delta IK. It means that you have to use the same index for both I and K. So it means that you're going to replace this K with I. So epsilon K will be replaced with I because you have to use the same index for both, either K or I. But you have to use I because this I is already outside here, right? This is this is arbitrary index that we have to use. The same thing, the second delta indicate that you have to use the same index for both J and L. It means that this L, it should be J. So this is going to give us the epsilon, J, I, uh, epsilon IJ plus the mu, the second term, this delta I L, you have to use the same index for both I and L. It means that this L it will be I. So this is gonna give us epsilon, the second index will be I. And K, the same index for both K and J, it means that you're gonna replace J, epsilon K with J. Make sense? So this is gonna be the form. And something that you should understand about this strain tensor, that this component is identical to this one, right? like epsilon ij equals to epsilon ji as we proved before right so what does it mean it means that you that is fine to consider this one as a common factor or you combine these two terms these two terms actually the already identical terms so we can combine them into this form a sigma a sigma ij this is the stress component equals lambda which is the first lemma constant delta epsilon kk or RR, QQ, any double dummy index, delta IJ, which is the chronicle distance, the uh, delta, plus the two mu times epsilon IJ, and this is the most common form of the stress tensor in terms of the strain tensor component in the index notation. So this is the constitutive equation. This is the constitutive equations that we have to use or we are going to use in linear elasticity for this one for what is the type of the material okay let me just have a space so what are these constitutive equations we could say that these are the constitutive equations these are the constitutive equations for first linear elastic material why these are the constitutive for linear elastic material because starting from the strain energy energy density function we wrote this in strain energy density function for linear elastic material and we end up with this expression right with this one then this c it will take this form for an isotropic material to end up with this expression so this is also for isotropic material for isotropic isotropic and also it should be homogeneous material homogeneous material so generally speaking the constitutive equations for linear elastic isotropic homogeneous material is going to be this one 
where this depends on two material constants only. Remember that the C tensor, it was originally 81 material constants, but because since we are not interested in the rotation and we're just interested in the, mic and the strain tensor, we, this 81 material constant reduced to 21. Then it reduced further to just two material constants for the isotropic linear elastic material and this material type is the most common type of material. All the engineering material that we are using as engineer, they already linear elastic isotropic material. So that's why in all the courses that you used to study in the mechanics of material class, the dynamic class, the design of machinery, all the courses that related to engineering, to the mechanical engineering, we used to use two material constants only for any material, which are the Poisson's ratio in addition to the to the uh, Young's models, right? So these are the constitutive equations for linear elastic material, isotropic material, and this is the thing that we're gonna focus and use through this through this course. Make sense? What I'm gonna do now, right now, I'm just gonna show you how we can write explicitly this constitutive equation. Like, what is the sigma x x in terms of the epsilon uh, the epsilon component? The same thing. The uh, the other or the component of the stresses. So if I decided to write this one, again, I'm just gonna get, I'm gonna copy the sigma ij equals lambda epsilon kk. As I mentioned, we can replace this kk with any other dummy index, delta ij plus the um, uh, two mu epsilon ij. And remember that this lambda and mu, these are two material constants known as the lemma constants. And I'm gonna give you the expression of this lambda and, and new in terms of the Poisson's ratio and the Young's models of the material. But let us write first the sigma xx, the x component of the, stre of the stress. It should be lambda. RR is a dummy index. So what does it mean? It means that you have to repeat it three times. Once x, once y, once z. So we're going to have here lambda, then we're going to open the parentheses epsilon. xx should be repeated as xx plus epsilon. R is gonna be y, so it will be yy plus z, zz. So this term, it should be repeated three times. Here I'm writing, this is the compact form in the index notation. This is the index notation of the constitutive equation. Constitutive equations. Right? But these are the explicit form for all the components. Plus, so this is the first term. We already got the first term. How about the second term? But it's 2 mu, and this epsilon should take the same index as sigma. So sigma is xx, so it means that it should be xx here. I'm sorry, uh, epsilon xx. You got it? So this is the first term that we already have. The second term, this sigma, let us consider, for example, sigma yy. So it's gonna be the same, lambda times. But there is a condition for this one, why? This term will have a value under only one condition in case that i and j is repeated index, like this case, like xx, so that's why we had this term. Here, the, we do have sigma yy, it means that the i, j, it is a repeated index, it means that this term will have a value. So it means this or equals one, this delta ij at this instant when i and j both equal, equals to y, this is gonna be one and it should be, you have to repeat over this dumb index. So that's why we're gonna have lambda epsilon xx plus epsilon yy plus epsilon zz. So as you can see, this term it had been repeated as it is plus, this term it will be different to mu epsilon yy. Why you didn't repeat over this one? Because there is no delta and there is no, there is no double, uh, dummy index in this case. So if this is yy, it should be yy. If it is xy, it should be xy. If it is ij in general, it should be ij, the same index. But this is dummy index that should be repeated, but under only one condition, in case that i and j are the same index, like the xx and yy and the zz, like sigma zz, is gonna give us the lambda times the epsilon xx plus the epsilon yy plus the epsilon zz it should be repeated right plus how about the th the other term it should be the two mu but epsilon zz how about the sigma xy sigma xy as you can see the ij indices they are not equal the two different indices it means that this term will be zero because this delta will be zero 
This is the clinical delta definition, as if you remember, right? So this term will be zero for the sigma xx, xy, for the sigma xz, for the sigma yz. Any two different indices, this term will be zero, but we just gonna have only one term. So this is gonna be zero. Moving to the second term, two mu, if this is xy, it should be xy. So it's gonna give us two mu epsilon xy tensor or component. So sigma xz is going to be the same. Definitely this term, the first term will be zero because we do have two different indices, but this term it will be, have, it will have a value like epsilon xz. And the third, the last term, which is sigma yz is going to give us the two mu epsilon yz. These are the six components of the stress in terms of the six components of the strain, which are very similar to the stress strain relation that you had before in the mechanics of material class. But in the mechanics of material class, you used to represent these things in terms of E, which is the Young's modulus, and U, which is the Poisson's ratio, right? And I'm gonna let you know what does it mean, the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. I'm pretty sure that you have an idea about them before, but I'm just gonna remind you with these two terms or the material constant. But generally speaking, this is the constitutive equation. The sex component of the stress is in terms of the strain, in terms of the lambda and mu, which are the lemma constants. And it is preferred to consider this constitutive equation into this form. Make sense? So this is like the compact form and these are the explicit form. You have to acknowledge this dilatational term. This is commonly known as the dilatational term, which is the, or, or the trace, because this is the trace or the diagonal components, which is, uh, which are the epsilon xx, epsilon y, y, and epsilon z, z. In addition to this is the mu, which is related more to the uh, sh uh, shear strain. Of the uh, of the material, right? So, how about this lambda and mu? If generally the lambda it should equal to the new times e divided by one plus new times the one negative two new. This is gonna be the expression of the lambda in terms of new and e. What is e? This is the Young's modulus. What is new? This is the Poisson's ratio, and mu it should be the e over two one plus new. In the mechanics of material class, we use to represent this mu as G, which is the shear modulus. Uh, this is the shear modulus, right? Or the shear rigidity uh, mat, uh, modulus or uh, the rigidity uh, modulus. So this is the shear modulus of the material, right? And, but as I mentioned in the academic thing, we are used to represent the thing using mu. Uh, but this is the engineering thing as you used to define this one. This is the shear modulus. This is the shear modulus, which is the second lemma uh, constant. It's related to the lemma constant, which is E, which is the Young's modulus divided by two uh, times one plus nu. And this is the uh, first lemma constant, which is known as the dilatational constant. In, in the mechanics of material course, this term was not included. You didn't consider this one that much, but it is already included here into these equations as I'm gonna show you. But this, let me just write that this E, this is the Young's modulus of the material or the elastic modulus of the material. And this is material property, right? And this is the Poisson's ratio, the Poisson's ratio. Simply the Young's modulus, we can obtain it from the slope of the linear stress strain curve from the uh, uh, of of the last uh, of the stress strain curve if you remember from the mechanics of material class if this is the stress strain curve this is the epsilon this is the sigma and we're gonna end up with a, a linear curve within the elastic region then we we're gonna have the plastic region right Forget about the plastic region within the elastic. The slope of this line, this slope, is going to give us the E, which is the Young's modulus of this material. And that's why from the mechanics of material class, or even, yeah, from the, and the mechanical design course, this Young's modulus is the slope of the linear function. So there is a condition here that since we are talking about a Young's modulus, it means that this torque, it should be about a nonlinear, I'm sorry, a linear material. A linear material, because it's gonna have one slope that should be represented as a line. But if it is a nonlinear material, this Young's modulus will not be constant. And in this case, 
it won't gonna be valid to be named as Young's Mudras. It should be named as Elastic Mudras in general, right? So generally speaking, Elastic Mudras or, or Young's Mudras, since we already are interested in this course in linear elasticity, and this is the case, so the slope of this line is gonna give us the Young's Mudras. This is how we can determine this one experimentally through the tensile test. But how about the Boisson's ratio? The Boisson's ratio assembly, we can end it up with the tensile, by measuring the longitudinal strain to the and the transverse strain of the material. Like if we test this material through the tensile test as well, okay, like assume that you have this bar and we are going to stretch this bar from both sides, P over two with force. So it will be elongated. It will be elongated in this way. So it will have some epsilon XX along the X direction and there should be some contraction along YY, right? So how this strain is related, the longitudinal strain is related to the lateral strain. This is like epsilon lateral, this is the lateral strain, and this is generally the longitudinal strain. So how the longitudinal strain is related to the lateral strain, they gonna be related through nu, which is negative epsilon lateral divided by epsilon longitudinal. And this negative, it is affixed in the low or the formula of the Poisson's ratio. Why? Because we need this Poisson's ratio for many of, for all natural material, this Poisson's ratio should be within the range of zero to 0 0.5 for all natural materials. Like to have this Poisson's ratio positive, you should have, you have incorporated the negative here because the lateral strain is gonna be negative and the longitudinal strain in this case due to the stretch is gonna be positive. It means that we have a stretch, here we do have contraction. So since we're already having for within inside this lateral component or a strain, we do have a negative sign. So this negative sign shall be multiplied times a negative to end up with a positive value for the Poisson's ratio, right? So for all natural material, this Poisson's ratio it is positive within the range from zero to, uh, to five. Uh, now we can make some advanced material known as auxiliary material. This material, they do exhibit negative Poisson's ratios which is something weird that even if you try to talk to anybody these days even about that we may have a material with a negative Boisson's ratio, you're gonna think that you're already crazy, right? So it's gonna say uh, crazy, yeah, so... But basically we can do or manufacture, but these are artificial material, man-made material. These are not natural material. We are designing this type of material to end up with a material with a negative Poisson's ratio. I do have a paper published the, uh, this year or the past year in Nature uh, Scientific Reports about this material that I've prepared of manufacturing material as a meta material with a negative Poisson's ratio of negative 16. So it is, we can do these types of material and this is one of the part of research these days. But anyway, this is how the lemma constants are related to the Young's models and the Poisson's ratio of the material. If we plug these things here, we're gonna end up with the constitutive equation. If you just substitute with this lambda and mu, with the E and U, you're gonna end up with typically the same form of the constitutive equation as you used to have them in the mechanics of material class, right? So here we discussed so far, we discussed lots of, lots of things related to the constitutive equation, but we start from scratch. In the mechanics of material class, you had this religions direction, directly, even in terms of the E and new, the Boisson's ratios. But what is the physical meaning and the original thing of this equation? This is what we discussed through this video, starting from the strain energy density function, how we can drive this constitutive equation going through till we reach to this instant or this shape or form of the constitutive equation just for that depend on two material constants. This is for only under one condition that we do have linear elastic isotropic homogeneous material. Make sense? So this is for the, I don't think that we do have more to cover for this part except some examples that you can manage and because Simply these are, so the questions about this part, especially this equation is just, if you already given a strain field, and you plug the strain field into these equations, and you already given the lambda and mu, you can easily end up with these components of the, of the stress, okay? So what we discussed so far in the previous video, we discussed the stress in relation to the external forces, the surface tractions. 
also the relation of the between the stress. So we said that the stress is related to the surface structures through the equation that sigma j i or t i equals the n j sigma j i, right? Or uh, th this expression. So this is how the surface structures are already related to the stresses, and we said that this surface structure will result in some stresses within the continuum and these stresses are conjugate or related to some strain the changes in the dimension the shape of the continuum then we discussed these stresses and how they are related to the body forces and we said that the stresses can be related to the body forces through the equilibrium equations then today we discussed the constitutive equation that how we can relate the stresses to the strains this is what we already covered in 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 this part all right, so uh, yeah, I don't think that there is something that we can cover more in this part. The next meeting or the next video, we are gonna discuss the energy methods, the uh, potential, the minimization of potential energy method, and we and we gonna know how we can use these variational methods to drive the uh, equilibrium equations for different uh, continua that we're going to drive the same equation, the equilibrium equation that we drive before starting from the mechanics of discrete system of particles. But here we're going to drive them based on another concept that more related to the continuum mechanics, which depends on the energy method, that would incorporate some measures related to the boundary conditions. We didn't discuss the boundary condition things, but we're going to need it here since we, uh, in the second half of this course, we are going to cover some applications on these uh, linear elasticity and continuum mechanics things. All right. So thank you for this for today and see you in our next, uh, next video. Thank you.